We wake up in the morning, we're stressed. Our blood sugar is all dysregulated because of the cortisol from not sleeping well. We run to the local Starbucks, we buy a 900 calorie low fat blueberry muffin and a vente whatever. The pancreas is going cold blue, cold blue. It's circulating all this insulin, except the muscle cells are going, what do we need it for? This guy's going to sit all day at the computer at work. And then when he comes home, he's going to sit in front of the couch with the clicker. We don't need the glucose, folks. We close our doors and the cells, the muscle cells won't take the sugar or the insulin. Welcome back to the Digest This Podcast. I'm your host, Bethany Cameron. And today's guest is Dr. Johnny Bowden, who is the author of The Great Cholesterol Myth. And today we dive deep into what cholesterol is and why our body needs it, how it plays an important role in our hormones, uh, what we got wrong about cholesterol, different diets for cholesterol, lifestyle changes, and so much more. Everybody, male and female, needs to listen to this podcast. But before we get into it, shout out to user Jenny D6270. She wrote a podcast review and I just wanted to share it. She says, I look forward to new episodes of this podcast and listening on my way home from work. It's one of my favorites for healthy tips and is always backed by research. Highly recommended. Thank you so much, Jenny D. And I always love reading every one of your reviews and I just appreciate all your support. And by rating and reviewing really helps get this podcast out into more ears and My hope is so that everyone listening can benefit from it and live a happier and healthier life. So if you haven't done so, please, it takes like two seconds, go rate and review. It will help me out so much. If you want a $200 Amazon gift card, all you have to do is give this show a five-star rating and review, and I'll be sending someone this special gift. Just be sure to include your Instagram handle at the end of the review because that is the way I will be reaching out and perhaps sliding into your DMs. So pause this episode and rate and review for your chance to get a $200 Amazon gift card. 20 million Americans suffer from chronic digestive diseases, and many of these issues can be avoided by simply digesting food properly. That's why our body needs digestive enzymes. Usually, digestive enzymes are produced in different parts of the body, like the mouth, where digestion begins, stomach, pancreas, and small intestine. But many of us don't make enough enzymes or can't use them properly. This is why supplementing with digestive enzymes is crucial for optimum digestion and absorption. Back in 2020, I created my very own digestive enzyme capsules that you can easily swallow or break open and sprinkle over your meal or blend it into a smoothie. My digestive enzymes only contain the enzymes you want and more of them, so it's super concentrated. I wanted each pill packed with the most they could hold. There's no soy, gluten, gums, or silicone dioxide commonly found in many pills. None of the nasties, only the good stuff. And right now, I am doing a buy one, get one free sale. This has never happened before, so grab them before they're gone. You can get up to eight bottles, so stock up. Just go to the special link. I'll leave it in the description of the show, but I'll also say it here. It's newsest.us slash enzyme BOGO. The deal will automatically be applied. Welcome, Dr. Johnny. Thanks for having me, Bethany. I'm really enjoying being here and I'm very happy that you invited me. And then we'll get to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is heart disease and cholesterol. And all the things we got wrong about it. Heart disease, cholesterol, and what we're doing wrong today and what we did wrong and and how we can navigate through that and um, how we can really help people as well that uh, may have some serious issues. So 
let's start really at the basics. What is cholesterol and what role does it play in our body? And why do we need it? Well, I don't know if you remember those old um, ads, uh, the Nancy Reagan campaign against drugs, and they used to show you your brain and, and scrambled eggs. And they said, this is your brain with the egg. And then they scramble it and they say, this is your brain on drugs. And you basically, you know, you have scrambled brain. Um, the same thing is kind of true with cholesterol. This is your body on cholesterol. It does great. You take it out and you got scrambled eggs. Your cholesterol is needed for every cell in the body. It's needed to produce hormones. It's needed to produce vitamin B, uh, D. It is the parent molecule for all the sex hormones. Without cholesterol, you're dead, just like the scrambled eggs in the pot. You're finished. It's, it's sort of if you had a balloon and you pricked it, that's what your body looks like without cholesterol. So we have demonized this absolutely essential compound and kind of made it the whipping boy for everything related to heart disease. And that's just a very simplistic view of how cholesterol works in the body and what it does, its functions, uh, its importance, and the need to obsessively bring down LDL cholesterol. It's a misplaced, in my opinion, it's a misplaced effort and it causes us to take our eye off the ball of what really matters to heart disease and what we could really be doing about it. Now, many people misunderstood me and Dr. Sinatra, when we wrote The Great Cholesterol Myth, which was almost a decade ago, and then we did a revised version two years ago, which has even more information, which I hope we're going to be talking about. Um, and they thought that we were saying cholesterol doesn't matter. We're not saying cholesterol doesn't matter. Let's be very, very clear. What we're saying is that we are measuring it in an antiquated and useless way. So I will give you a great example. Okay. I live in California and we have very strict emissions uh, requirements for our cars. Oh, yes. I, I live in California too. I am oh, very yeah. well aware. Great. So you got to go, if you have a car that's over, I don't know how many years, you, you get a notice, you got to take it to one of those, those stations where they measure it. And then they tell you, oh, Mr. Jones, well, you got this wrong with it and that wrong with it. You got to get it fixed. It's going to cost $1,500, whatever it is. And you aren't happy to hear that information, but you do it because A, you want to be a good citizen and you don't want to be driving a toxic waste dump around and B, because it's legally required. You don't have any very much choice. So what if you then found out you've been doing this faithfully like a good citizen, you've been fixing it every single time that you go in to get it evaluated. And now you find out that the machine hasn't been calibrated for 40 years. And that there are a million toxins in the environment that that machine doesn't even know about because they weren't invented when that machine was calibrated. And you are just as likely to get a false positive as a false negative. And meanwhile, you've been going spending $1,500 every couple of years to fix something that may not even be broken because the machine isn't measuring it properly. Now, that doesn't mean that emissions aren't important. Doesn't mean that you don't want to know what your car is putting out. It means that that ain't the way to measure it. And you got to bring mm -hmm. that measurement thing into the 21st century. So it can actually tell you what modern chemicals are being released, things that maybe just came out in the last 10 years that we didn't even know about when the machine was made. That is what our cholesterol test is. If you people just think about this for just a minute, how silly and simplistic it is to take something and say, well, there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So the first thing you gotta know is it's the same cholesterol. Under a microscope, you cannot tell the difference between good and bad. Here's the difference. It travels in a different kind of boat. Cholesterol is the cargo, the lipoprotein, the L in LDL, the L in HDL, that last L stands for lipoprotein. That's the container that holds the cholesterol. That is what we need to be measuring. And here's, here's a very clear example of why. If you are 
trying to prevent accidents on the on the highway. What's the most important thing for you to know? The cargo in the cars, like what's in the glove compartment or what's in the back seat or what people are carrying in the trunk or what's in their suitcases or the number of cars on the road. Clearly, if you're trying to prevent accidents, you got to know what the traffic pattern is. You got to know how many cars. You don't care what they've got in their glove compartment. They have a pack of cigarettes. They have a, a, a bathing suit because they're going to the beach. Does it matter? That's the cargo. How many cars are in there? Because the more cars on the road, the more likelihood of an accident. It's just simple math. If you're a bouncer in a nightclub, the more people in the nightclub, I don't care if they're the nicest people in the world, the more likelihood somebody's going to spill a drink, somebody's going to step on someone's toes, someone's going to get drunk, more likelihood there's going to be a fight. So right. what we need to be looking at is the number of lipoproteins in circulation, not how much cholesterol they're carrying. And so for for doctors, when when you're getting a you know a cholesterol test done, they are looking basically they're looking at the wrong the wrong levels. The everything is skewed. They're looking at a, a division of cholesterol. It travels in two different kinds of containers, LDL and HDL. They're looking at a very simplistic division. We now know that there's more like 13 different kinds of containers. LDL isn't bad and all HDL isn't good. We need to start using modern technology to go, do you have small particles or big particles? How many how many LDLs are coming down the, the, the highway? That's how you prevent the accidents from happening, by knowing how many boats are in the water, not what they are carrying. So is it then the doctor that's measuring it wrongly or are we just not testing efficiently? Are we getting the wrong test? So we didn't... We're getting the wrong test and it's not completely the doctor's fault. Okay. The doctors are completely stymied by the insurance companies and what they will pay for. They don't want to pay for the modern test, even though it's been out for over 15 years. They don't want to. And if the doctor, who generally doesn't even know how important that test is because they're in the system too, and they got a nice little system there, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, your bad cholesterol is over 100 and whatever it is, and they go, oh, we're going to put you on a stat, and they don't look any further. Mm -hmm. That's how the insurance, that's how the medical industrial complex works. So if you get a doctor who's a functional medicine doctor and says, well, I'm not going to use that test. That's just silly. We're going to use the modern test that actually tells you what we need to know about cholesterol. The insurance companies often come back to them and go, you know, you're ordering a lot of tests that aren't covered. We're going to have to audit you. And uh, th this happens all the time. So they are not really motivated to look for more tests or better tests. If it's not covered by insurance, um, it's very hard to get it done unless you pay for it yourself. I have been having the correct test for the past five years and I paid for it myself. Okay, well, let's go into that. How do you get tested? Where do you go and what kind of test do you need to get done? There are different names for this, but we have two major labs in this country, LabCorp and Quest. Yeah. They do the bulk of all blood testing, no matter what doctor you go to, whether it's Kaiser, whether it's the most expensive private functional medicine doctor, they send it out to either LabCorp or Quest. Both of these labs have advanced cholesterol testing. Uh, they're often called cardiac IQ. They're often called the particle test. Particles in science means lipoproteins. So we're, we're really talking about the number of lipoproteins. Um, cardiac IQ, uh, the particle test, the NMR particle test. There's a lot of different names for them, but they are advanced cardiac pro uh, uh, lipid profiling. They're all tests that go well beyond good and bad. Good and bad cholesterol is like giving you a medical diagnosis based on whether you're short or tall. I mean, okay. short or tall is a variant. It is something mm -hmm. that is useful to know. But would you get a diagnosis based on that one silly division when we have the entire human genome decoded? We're going to look at whether you're just short or tall. 
So why would you look at just whether your cholesterol is carried by an LDL or an HDL, especially when we now know there's HDL2, HDL2A, 2A, 2B, LDL3, A, 3B, lipoprotein, little a, oxidized LDL. There's a million different kinds. We're ignoring them, looking at this idiotic 1963 division that was good at one time. So was a flip phone. Nobody's using a flip phone to text anymore. Mm -hmm. Why are we using the good and bad cholesterol test when we've got the equivalent of the iPhone 14? So if let's just say their doctor is not going to test them for it, right? They've tried. Can someone pay out of pocket, go to Quest or LabCorp.com? You still need to get a prescription. But I have noticed in some of the doctors that I follow, like, for example, Michael Eads, um, that he that they now have you can actually go directly to order to get these tests and they have doctors. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I've noticed that Michael Eads has a, a thing on his, on his sub stack where there's a company that you can go to and you can order this advanced testing. And of course, all of us recommend that that's exactly what you can do. There is right. one, one workaround. Okay. There is a, I'm just looking online too. I've done this actually myself. It's um, called walkinlab.com. I'm not sure if you're familiar. No, but um, there's a lot of them. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Mike Eads advertises one of them. And there, okay. are, there are a number of them where you can do that. And um, I think at one point, Life Extension, which is a great organization that also makes vitamins, they had uh, mm-hmm. they had lab tests that you could order, with, which have doctors that will actually prescribe them for you on staff. Um, okay. So I think, you, I think it is possible now to get it yourself. Now, the workaround is, there's another test that your doctor has heard of. Okay. And that is often covered and it's called the APOB test, a- APOB test, A-P-O-B. It's a good surrogate for the particle test because every bad lipoprotein, every lipoprotein that has a chance of being oxidized, inflamed, turning into something that you don't want, lodging itself in the artery wall and becoming plaque, every one of them is surrounded with a protein called APO- APOB. So if you actually count the numbers of APLB in your circulation, you're kind of knowing how many LDLs there are. Okay. And does everyone have, is there like a baseline or since everyone's health is different, we're all unique. So I'm assuming everyone's cholesterol, there's no just one size fits all for cholesterol, right? When, when you get the modern test, there are going to be ranges. And they'll say, we'd like the particles to be under a thousand is terrific. Thousand to fifteen hundred is, you know, the yellow range, fifteen hundred mm-hmm. to twenty two hundred, whatever is the red range. I'm making these numbers up because I don't know exactly what they are on each test, but there are ranges of very good, a little questionable, kind of dangerous. Mm-hmm. And can someone, does it depend on like how old a person is, what their weight is? And that determines also that factors into what's you know healthy for that person i don't know the algorithms that each lab test uses but yes okay. when you get a test it, it shows you this is me i'm 76 years old uh, this is my uh, sex this is my um mm-hmm. cost all the cholesterol stuff these are my neutrophils these are my liver panel and it's it's all there you know just like a regular blood test except instead of giving you two numbers hdl and ldl it gives you quite a few very useful numbers. For example, the size of the particles. Okay. The, the, little, the LDLs that are small and dense are much more likely to become atherogenic. LDLs that are large and fluffy, they don't do a lot of harm. So you need to know the size. You need to know, the, and they, they call that a pattern. Are you mostly small and dense? That's pattern B. That's not good. Or are you mostly big and fluffy? That's pattern A. That's desirable. And then they, you look at the number of boats in the water, the number of lipoproteins. And this is all very clearly laid out on the tests. And you can see it very, you can see it visually, you can see the numbers, and then you can start to work to make those numbers uh, be something that you want them to be. But we're not chasing low LDL numbers. It's just so out of date. Okay. All right. Well, and heart disease is the leading cause of death, which I feel like a lot of people don't realize that. Um, now, because that is the, the the case and those are the statistics, 
I feel like a lot of people want low cholesterol because of heart disease. Now, they want low cholesterol because they think low cholesterol equals low risk of heart disease. That's not true. Can you elaborate on that? And Because we're measuring what they mean by low cholesterol is low LDL. I don't care about high or low LDL. I want to know what kind of LDL you have. I want to know how many LDLs you have. That's what matters. It's not the cholesterol that, that, that LDLs, let's call them lipoproteins, because remember, cholesterol's just the cargo. They're just what's found in the car. They're not the car itself. Remember, cholesterol doesn't travel on water. It has to be in a container. Trying to get cholesterol to travel on water would be like throwing, you know, canola oil into the ocean. It's not going to float. It needs to be in a container. And that's the LDL. That is where our focus should be. Okay. And do you think that cholesterol is the cause of heart disease or do you think it's other factors like stress and environment and toxins? And, you know, what do you think? It's one factor. And again, I I really want to, I don't want to call it cholesterol because that contributes to this notion that cholesterol is the bad guy. What's the problem is these lipoproteins that are floating through the uh, bloodstream get damaged. They get inflamed. They get oxidized. Then they get into a parking space where they don't belong in the endothelial wall. Then stuff starts to happen. Calcium comes and puts a cap on it and bacteria and things accumulate in there. And now you have plaque and then it kind of can ooze out if it breaks. That's the problem, not the cholesterol. It's the lipoproteins Mm -hmm. in the first place that get damaged and cause problems. Interesting. And how do they get damaged? Oxidation, oxidative damage, the same way your skin gets damaged by the sun and you get oxidative damage on your skin. You can get that in your LDLs. The the chemicals that we're exposed to can damage them. The the environmental oxidative stress, oxidative Mm -hmm. stress, inflammation, all the things that cause inflammation can inflame your LDL particles. That makes the big ones into smaller ones and more dense and more oxidized. And all of a sudden they're stuck somewhere they don't need to be stuck. And then there's a whole series of biochemical reactions. We talk about it in the book, The Great mm-hmm. Cholesterol Myth. And meanwhile, you can wind up with unstable plaque and that's not a good thing. I feel like all of this is going back to something so simple is reducing inflammation, reducing stress, oxidative stress, and all these things. And it goes back to as simple as diet, lifestyle, thing, you know, taking the toxins out of our environment. And um, I, I just remember to even, if, I don't know, maybe it still says this on the package, but Quaker Oats, for example, it says, helps lower cholesterol. Cheerios helps lower cholesterol. And that- Well, the medical industrial complex. This is a huge edifice that the entire economy is is based on to a large extent. Big food, big pharma, and all of these kind of myths that keep us going. Yeah, Cheerios are good, heart healthy. Are you kidding me? I mean, people, open your eyes. and just think about it. If it passes the smell test, a, a manufactured cereal from a processed grain that's got a ton of sugar, no mm-hmm. fiber, nothing of any value in it. That's going to be heart healthy. They bought that. Oh yeah, and for a lot of people listening, if it says you know um, like the check for good for a healthy heart or whatever, they pay for that. And I, I feel like a lot of people, I'm sure you can elaborate on this, is that big pharma and the the big food industry, they're all connected. It's a big circle. We call it the medical industrial complex. Let's talk about diet for a second. So I'm pretty sure it's pretty clear, like Cheerios, it's probably not the best thing. Uh, wh- what do you feel the whole low fat, uh, high carb movement back in the 90s? I feel like that could just kind of wrecked everything. Uh, what's your take on diet, uh, keto, and how that can, re- can help? I have very simple nutrition advice that I've been giving for years that is the best nutrition advice I ever got and the best nutrition advice I've ever given in 33 years of doing that. And it is very simple. Eat real food. Now, if you're not sure, many people are not sure what real food is. They think, well, kale chips are real. No, kale chips are not real food. Kale is real food. We had a program that was popular a couple of years ago called a Whole30, um, where people literally committed. It was like the ice challenge for Alzheimer's. Nothing but whole foods for 30 days. I believe you should be on nothing but whole foods for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That is a goal. 
obviously you can have birthday cake once in a while you can have some recreational eating but if you're looking for a target if you're looking for a bullseye in terms of diet it's eat real food i often joke that eat food from the johnny bowden four food groups what are the johnny bowden four food groups food you could hunt fish gather or pluck if you were naked on the african serengeti with a stick what could you catch what could you fish what could you hunt what could you gather what could you pluck from a tree if you can pluck it if you can gather it if you could hunt it or you could fish it it's probably 95 percent really good for you and the rest is details how much protein how much carbs very important not as important as eating real food. I love it. And if you're not sure if it's real food, it probably isn't. Probably isn't. And right. that means food with all the fat that comes with it. So what is your take on grains? Do you feel like that plays a part? Or obviously like Cheerios, that's glyphosate all written all over it, first of all. Do you feel like someone should go off of grains or is that individualized? It's individualized. Um, years ago, in fact, when I first started studying nutrition, this was one of the first papers assigned to me. Professor Lorne Cordain, who is often considered the father of the modern paleo movement, uh, wrote a, a very long academic paper called Cereal Grains, Humanity's Double-Edged Sword. Mm. And what he basically claimed in there was everything went downhill when grains became the mainstay of our diet. However, we would not have civilization without them. So you cannot feed 8 billion people on the planet without grains. There's just not enough food to hunt and fish and gather and pluck. You got to have some of this. And that allowed civilization, that allowed people to live in villages. It allowed civilization to develop. It allowed us to feed 8 billion people. However, when you look at what happened to our health, stature goes down, autoimmune diseases start coming up. There's a lot of things that are not so great about grains. And remember, it's a big tent, the whole idea of grains. Things, when we, we fetishize this whole grain thing. These cereals are made with whole grains, but there's no whole grains remaining in them. You can't mm -hmm. eat a whole grain. You can't pluck a stalk of wheat and, wheat and start eating it. It's got to be processed. It's got to be pulverized into flour. And then when you start to grow it in these enormous compounds, these factory farms and stuff, it's got to be sprayed. It's got to be. Uh, oh, yeah, it's sprayed. Up. And it's just in general, I mean, it's, it's a compromise. I'm not. I think that people can live very well with a moderate amount of grains, especially if you're thinking back, you know, in Eastern Europe and they would cook these bread, these bake these breads that were all grainy and they actually came out of the oven and they were so hard and fibrous. Um, yeah, of course, you can do some of that. And of course, that's part of the Mediterranean diet and a lot of other diets. But we have taken these grains, fetishized them so much whole grains and low fat dairy and all of these made up concepts that have nothing to do with real food. And we've made them not just a little piece of the diet, but the but the bulk of the diet. And everything is so, it's so refined too. Everything is so refined and then it's fortified with fake vitamins. And then you're left with basically glyphosate sprayed cereal that's just air. And then it leaves you feeling more hungry. You're not satisfied. So I just want to speak on diet again for a second. What's your take on intermittent fasting? One of the best interventions we've ever discovered in humanity. Right up there with, I don't know, with sunshine and, and sex, as Atkins used to say. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it's literally one of the greatest inventions we've ever come up with. And it didn't start a few years ago when the magazine started putting it on the cover everywhere. We've been intermittent fasting since the dawn of time. Well, I can tell you, I intermittent fast and I was doing it before I knew I was intermittent fasting. I just, I didn't even know what intermittent fasting was, but I just didn't eat until like 11, 12, I had some coffee in the morning and then it started getting buzz. I'm like, oh, I, I guess I've been doing that all along and I just felt better. So what does it do for the body? Oh, it does so many things. Um, it gives the digestive system a rest. It allows your blood sugar and your insulin, which I'd love to talk about in just a second, to return to normal levels. It allows some of the inflammation in the gut to heal. 
Uh, it doesn't put the tax on the liver that constantly digesting food. Listen, I was a trainer in the 1990s. I started Equinox Fitness Club. I was as bad as everybody else. I was telling people eat every two hours. The worst mm -hmm. advice you can imagine. That's going to guarantee that your blood sugar and insulin are always elevated. A, you'll never lose weight that way. And B, you're going to constantly be in an inflammatory state. There's no time to heal that whole mechanism. So that whole notion of grazing, eating every two hours is idiotic. And it was done because we didn't even realize at the time that all of our clients had sugar burning metabolisms. They had been so accustomed to eating every two hours and to eating sugar that their bodies did not know how to metabolize the fat on their own bodies to use it for energy. What we try to teach people now is how to have a fat burning metabolism or a flexible metabolism that if you're not eating, instead of being starving and climbing the walls, your body goes, oh, well, I got a whole savings account of fat here. I'll just go there and burn it up. And that's what you want. You want a flexible metabolism like that. But if you're eating a power bar every two hours to keep your energy up, just major fiction is what all that is, you are guaranteeing that you will never go into a fat burning, that you will not easily and frequently go into a fat burning state. Why should you? The body's going, oh, I got this easy source of energy right here. I don't need to go to the bank account. Mm -hmm. So a keto diet basically tricks your body into going, you know, you don't have that easy source of energy anymore. You better find something else, dude. And what it does is it takes the fat, burns them up. Byproduct of that is ketones. It uses ketones just fine. You have to train it to do that, but it's a perfectly good source of energy. Some would say even a better source of energy than glucose. Did you know you swallow 5 to 7% of toothpaste every single time you brush your teeth? That's an entire blob of toothpaste every seven days. And most commercial toothpastes are filled with harsh chemicals, artificial flavors, preservatives, titanium dioxide, and dyes. And I often get asked on my Instagram what toothpaste I recommend. And for a while, I was trying to find one with better for you ingredients and something that actually made my mouth feel great. Because I've tried so-called non-toxic toothpastes, but I never felt like they were actually getting the job done, if you know what I mean. And they didn't even leave my mouth feeling fresh. But I'm so glad to have stumbled across Bite Toothpaste. These are actually tablets you put in your mouth and bite down on to start your brushing experience. Bite Toothpaste bits are so convenient, you just pop a bit in your mouth, chew it up, and start brushing. It will turn to a paste just like you're used to, but with no plastic tube or messy paste. It took a few times for me to get used to it because my entire life I've been using a paste, but now I love them. I also love their mouthwash bits because I can carry these tablets wherever I go and do a quick rinse even in my car. Bite also now has a natural teeth whitening kit. So if you've been looking for a natural toothpaste without the paste, Try Bite Toothpaste tablets that come in glass jars to help reduce plastic waste and experience what I and so many others are obsessed with. Bite is offering my listeners 20% off your first order. Go to trybite.com slash digest or use code digest at checkout to claim this deal. That's T-R-Y-B-I-T-E dot com slash digest. Well, let's talk about blood sugar and, and insulin for a second and what that does to the body, what spikes it. And maybe this is a little bit too narrowed down, but what should you have when you break a fast? Because I know that certain things, let's say when you wake up in the morning or the first meal of the day can spike your blood sugar or it cannot, right? If instead of eating eggs and avocado, first thing you eat, I don't know, piece of toast. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about blood sugar and insulin first, uh, before we even talk about what to do to break a fast. I think the, the question about blood sugar and insulin is, is more important, is, is more critical to understanding that. And then the, the answer to that will, will come into play. Yeah. So right. when you eat food, your blood sugar rises. Now 
It rises more in response to certain kinds of foods than others, but pretty much most of the time you eat a meal, your blood sugar goes up. That's what it does. When your blood sugar goes up, the pancreas immediately responds by, by squirting out a little hormone called insulin, which is absolutely critical to our survival. And insulin's first job is it's kind of like the chaperone in the playground. It needs to round up that extra sugar because high blood sugar is really dangerous. So it goes there and it goes, oh, the, he just ate, his blood sugar's going up. Send in the insulin troops. The insulin comes in there. It rounds up the excess sugar. It takes it to the muscle cells. Muscle cells are really happy to use it because they love to use sugar for energy. Your blood sugar comes back down. Insulin's done its job. It goes back down to normal levels. You are fine. That's how metabolism is supposed to work. That is a healthy metabolism. Here's what happens to us. We wake up in the morning. We're stressed. Our, our blood sugar is all dysregulated because of the cortisol from not sleeping well. We run to the local Starbucks. We buy a 900 calorie low fat blueberry muffin and a vente whatever. Our sugar levels are now here. The pancreas is going cold blue, cold blue. It's, it's circulating all this insulin, except that when the insulin tries to take that sugar and take it to the muscle cells, the muscle cells are going, what do we need it for? This guy's going to sit all day at the computer at work. And then when he comes home, he's going to sit in front of the couch with the clicker. We don't need the glucose, folks. Done. We close our doors and the cells, the muscle cells won't take the sugar or the insulin. Now you got a problem. You got high blood sugar. You got insulin. What's the insulin going to do? It's got to get that sugar out of there. Well, guess what? The fat cells say, hey, we don't have any problem. Bring it to us. So now you start to put on a little bit of weight. You're still not diabetic because your insulin's managing to keep your blood sugar low enough so that your doctor doesn't yet diagnose that as diabetes. But it's really having to work hard and it's having to take that sugar and put it into the fat cells. After a while, do that for a couple of years, the fat cell says, we're done. We don't want it either. Now you've got high blood sugar and high insulin. That is the definition of diabetes. Now, when Steve and I wrote the revised edition to the great cholesterol myth, we looked at research going back to the 1970s and we looked really carefully and we looked at what was hiding in plain sight. And it turned out that one of the best predictors of heart disease, one of the earliest signs of upcoming distress or upcoming chronic disease was insulin resistance. That's the, that is exactly what I just described to you. The muscles become resistant to the effects of insulin. They won't take it into the cells anymore. The sugar is now elevated in your bloodstream. That's called insulin resistance. 88% of Americans have some degree of insulin resistance. You, your listeners have probably maybe never heard of insulin resistance, but you did hear of pre-diabetes. They are the same thing. Pre-diabetes technically is called insulin resistance syndrome. That is insulin resistance. And 88, look up this figure, bet me, don't ever believe anything I say without checking it. 88%, you will find a dozen articles, Science Daily, all of the published literature, 12% of Americans metabolically healthy, meaning that they don't have any degree of insulin resistance. And insulin resistance only gets worse as you get older if you don't do anything about it. Insulin resistance is treatable, preventable, um, reversible in most cases with diet, with fasting, and with lifestyle changes like reduction of stress. You can turn it around. And we're not even looking at it. We're looking at LDL cholesterol. Well, that's good news for everyone listening. and But also, I mean, I've even heard that children are now pre-diabetic. I mean- 88% you of know, Americans of all yeah, ages. Children. And you're thinking- They used to you- call type two diabetes adult onset diabetes. They don't call it adult onset diabetes anymore because we're seeing it in 11 year olds. Tr- oh, I'm seeing it in even younger just because of the, the baby uh, formula that they're being fed you know, and that's starting from infants. Let's go back to the blood sugar issue. So I told you that when you eat food, your blood sugar goes up and this whole system starts with insulin. Right. But I also told you that it depends on the food because some foods are more glycemic, meaning they raise blood sugar quicker and and faster and higher than others. So the food, the food group that raises blood sugar and therefore insulin 
the highest and the fastest and the most without question, hands down, is carbohydrates. The second group of foods that will raise insulin and blood sugar a little, but nothing like carbohydrates, is protein. What do you think that does to blood sugar? Zero. Zero doesn't move the needle. What have we been told to eat since the 1980s to prevent diabetes and heart disease? A high carb, low fat diet. We're telling people to eat less of the one thing that doesn't screw with their blood sugar and insulin and more of the one thing that does. Now, here's a question. Do you think that advice was on purpose because they want to get us sick? Incredibly stupid advice, much like a lot of the pandemic advice that we just didn't know any better at the time. And then people just dug in their heels. And then you had a whole industry making low-fat snack wall cookies and all this other crap. And, you know, it's very hard to turn around, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the Queen Elizabeth in the ocean. It's very hard to, to turn that ocean liner around once it's become an ocean liner. Yeah. Well, I do feel like the the needle is moving and more people are aware of the, the benefits of keto or a low carb, high fat diet or the benefits of fat in general. However, I feel that even though a lot of people just like people like you, me, my listeners, they know about this, yet the medical professionals are still recommending advice that was like given in the 90s. Yes, in the 80s. Absolutely. That is 100% true. I, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I have often said asking your doctor for nutrition advice is like asking your accountant for advice on your tennis game. I mean, they don't, why would your accountant know anything about tennis? They don't study. He might, your accountant he or she might be a great tennis player, but they didn't learn it in accounting school. And your doctor might actually be a good nutritionist, but he did not, he or she did not learn that in medical school. They have to go for additional training and most of them don't. I go to conferences, American College of Nutrition, which I'm a member of the American Society of Nutrition. You see a lot of MDs who are also nutritionists Maybe the same 200 or 300 physicians at every conference. There's 800,000 physicians in America. Most of them don't know the amount of nutrition you would learn in a high school economics class. And the fact that they sit there and tell you what nutritional supplements you should take and that there's no research on them and, oh, you don't need vitamin D, you can get it. For, they are The fact that they can sit there and talk with authority about something they know nothing about is absolutely maddening to me. Yeah, well, and I feel like if your doctor is recommending Ensure, then uh, that's just a red flag right there. Or uh, Tums for calcium? Yeah, yeah, I know. So if 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 they're recommending that that kind of stuff, then maybe it's time to, to see a doctor. doctors. Is that yeah, what because you're about to say? exactly because you know what? Guess what? You're paying to see that doctor. Uh, you can fire them too. <laughs> You find anyone. I mean, look, this is a whole, this is a much deeper conversation than just, you know, what's the best food to eat or what's it? Sure. Because look, people are used to having everything paid for by insurance. I would love to see us go to a pay for service model. You know, people go, what do you mean pay for my doctor? It's all covered by insurance. And you're getting the crappy kind of treatment and the crappy kind of uh, uh, suggestions and, and advice that you get when you don't pay for it. Right. Well, even if it's paid for insurance, I mean, you're still technically paying your insurance or if it's covered by your employer, then it's coming out of, you know, your paycheck. So you still are. Um, But I want to just touch a little bit on what foods are, quote, demonized as cholesterol raising, but are actually healthy, like egg yolks, for example. That's clear. Egg yolks, one of the best food. The, the egg white omelet, in my opinion, is should be the, 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 the Wikipedia example of the stupidest nutrition advice ever given to anybody in the history of the world. Eggs are a perfect food. The yolk contains not only a lot of the protein, but it, it, it contains... Um, Vitamin A, tons of... I, yeah. Nutrients for the eye, um, xenoxanthin and uh, um, acetylcholine, which is you know food for the brain. It's a superfood. It, it co- it, it, it's just an incredibly important food, and and to take the yolk out of it is is just it's idiotic. Now, I will, I do want to play devil's advocate. There are people who have done very low fat diets and have had a lot of success with it, but the key to it 
is whole food. I don't particularly like the low fat plan mm-hmm. or, or I, I, I don't think it's easy to stay on. I don't think it's satisfying. I think it's, uh, it requires a lot of willpower, but I would be crazy to say nobody's ever had success with a low fat diet. I just think we do much better with a, a diet that is balanced with good healthy fats, which include saturated fat. Let's be really clear. Mm-hmm. The demonization of that is another idiotic thing that we somehow got onto. And the research has been coming for the last 10 years. I can probably name right now five studies, five published studies. And I don't have my list of all the published studies, but there are, there are a, probably a dozen peer reviewed published studies that looked at saturated fat consumption and the end result of heart disease and found no connection. None. Zero. Amazing. And then also red meat. How do you feel about that? I think red meat, when it is raised ethically and in a healthy way, which means 100% grass fed, not grass fed the way the supermarkets often claim, which mm-hmm. we have to remember something, Bethany, every cow in America was grass fed for the first six months of its life. So you, yeah. you're dealing with one of the most, two of the most unscrupulous industries in the, the amoral industries in the world, big food and big pharma. Big food now knows that people are hip to the idea that grass fed is good. So they're slapping grass fed on $2.99 a pound meat. It's not grass. It was grass fed for the first six months and it was sent off to a factory farm to be raised on grain and finished on grain and then slaughtered. Mm-hmm. And it eats all the antibiotics and steroids and and bovine growth hormone and, and sprayed um, grain that it should never be eating in the first place. And all of that winds up in the fat. And it's not. It, it, it's a lie it, to say that's grass fed meat. You make a great point because a lot of people don't know the difference between grass fed and grass finished. Because grass finished means that they were fed grass the entire. That's what you want. And the, the best place to get that, I think, is the farmers market because you can talk to the farmers and they're very passionate about how they do this. Um, when you, I don't trust the supermarket grass fed meat, I really just don't trust it. Yeah, co-ops and, and different things like that. Um, th- those are great. So for those that don't know, th- the grass, a lot of grass fed, it's go- it's fed grass. And then the last, I would say, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I've heard, it's like the last three months, they're fed grains to fatten them up at the end of their life. And by the way, you, you pointed out something just accidentally that we should actually not just let go. To fatten them up, what do you think it does to us, folks? That's ask yeah. any cattle farmer, how do you fatten up cattle? They'll tell you two things, antibiotics and grains. And Skittles, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> there was that that Skittle thing, but I'll let that go. So yeah, like you said, as long as it's true grass-fed, responsibly raised, you know, all of that good stuff. Yeah, in that case, I think meat is a health food. Okay. In your in your book, The Great Cholesterol Myth, do, do you mention, I want to say, what would you point out that everyone should have in their daily routine? Well, I th- I'm glad you asked that. So Steve and I, when we wrote the, the revised edition, we spent a third of the book talking about things that had nothing to do with diet and exercise. Mm-hmm. It's crazy to not, I mean, in this day and age, we don't make a mind-body distinction anymore. It's not nature versus nurture. It's it's nature via nurture. They work together. It's one big porous circle with different entry points. And the mind talks to the body and the body talks to the mind. And the vagus nerve is the portal by which the brain touches the heart, the mind, and the gut and comes back up with other information. That's why we talk about gut feelings because we actually produce serotonin in our gut more than we do in our brain. So the point is that all of these things, stress reduction, community, uh, friendships, exercise, sunlight, walks in greenery. There's an entire school of psychotherapy called ecotherapy where they just talk about the physiological effects of being exposed to nature. So all of these things make a difference. Steve Sinatra, my, my late uh, co-author on the great cholesterol myth, the cardiologist, um, once did this experiment on himself. He was, uh, he was, um, about to do surgery and he hadn't eaten all day. And just out of fun, because he was in the hospital, he worked in the hospital, he can get his blood tested at any time, uh, just like we have the aura ring and stuff. He decided to check his cholesterol and his cholesterol was sky high. 
from stress. Mm. From stress. Just from stress. Yeah. There was no other reason. Yeah. He hadn't eaten. His his cholesterol readings were in the normal range up until and that day they were very high. So mm-hmm. stress can raise blood pressure, it can raise blood sugar, it can raise cholesterol as, as as it used to be measured. So the stress component is enormous. The the relaxation component is enormous. You know, when when the pandemic hit, I and every other nutritionist or functional nutritionist or functional medicine expert was asked a million times, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? So I live in California, all my Friends were going to Costco and cleaning out the vitamin C um, <laughs> shelves and the right. shelves, coming home and then watching Facebook all day and watching the numbers go up. And what are the case studies in Ohio and what's happening in Sweden and sitting in a pool of anxiety? And I said to them, you want to know what you should do? Turn off Facebook. Because first of all, that stress is eating up your vitamin C. That's the first thing stress does. It completely diminishes the stores of vitamin C. It also does the same thing to vitamin B5. So all these vitamins you're taking, folks, you would get a lot more value out of it if you would just turn the damn Facebook off. Yeah, yeah, the news, all that kind of stuff. So those are this is such great advice, and I know we're we're strapped for time here, but um, you did mention something at the very beginning of of the podcast that I kind of just want to touch on, if you don't mind. And you had mentioned um, that cholesterol regulates hormones, and it's very important. And can you elaborate? When I tell uh, men this, they all they all of a sudden pay attention. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> These hormones come from cholesterol. It's a precursor to most of your hormones. And I honestly, this is, I can't prove this. This is my own personal hypothesis. I do not think it's an accident that 50% of men in America are on statin drugs and erectile dysfunction drugs. I don't think that's a coincidence. You think it's on purpose? No, I, I think that that statin drugs have a lot to do with, oh, with for uh, sure. libido and with muscle pain and with memory loss and with a whole bunch of things. And it doesn't mean that they have no place in treatment. It means that we are giving them out like candy to treat a condition that we're measuring wrong. Got it. Yeah. Well, I think... So many people can benefit from this podcast and uh, I'm going to have to have you back because this was just such a a wealth of knowledge here. Um, And Dr. Johnny, where can people find you? What's your social? Pimp yourself out. At Johnny Bowden. And there's no H in Johnny, J-O-N-N-Y-B-O-W-D-E-N. And I also do a 12-week coaching program, group coaching program online. It's called The Rockwell weight and wellness reset and you can find that on instagram and tiktok and all kinds of you know little little areas where we do little videos and talk about the different things that we cover in the 12-week program but believe me we talk about all these things sleep sleep is so important for weight loss and people don't realize what it does and we could do an entire podcast on just how it dysregulates hormones that involve satiety and appetite so yeah i love that yeah, so sleep is important, digestion is important, the gut is critically important. All these things are really things that need to be looked at besides just what your LDL number is. Well, uh, let's let's have you back for another episode about sleep for sure. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Johnny and uh, everyone listening, go check him out, check out his book. We will see you next time. I have a website time. also, johnnybowden.com. Again, no H in Johnny. All right, thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digest This. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app to let us know. If you're ever wondering how you can support me and this podcast, sharing it with your friends and family is the best way. This is a resonant media production produced by Drake Peterson and edited by Chris McComb. To email the show, message us at digestthispod at gmail.com. See you next time. The content of this show is for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for individual medical and mental health advice and does not constitute a provider-patient relationship. As always, talk to your doctor or health team first. Looking to build a more robust foundation in your health and well-being? From the producer of Digest This comes one of the most popular alternative health shows on Apple Podcasts, The Dr. Tina Show. Dr. Tina Moore is a naturopathic physician and chiropractor, traditionally and alternatively trained in science and medicine. 
The show features exclusive interviews with experts such as Sean Stevenson, Mike Mutzel, Mark Groves, and even solo episodes covering metabolic health, pharmaceuticals, chronic diseases, long hauler syndrome, and pain management. Dr. Tina delivers the information in a no-nonsense, real-world style, and she has the science to back it up. The Dr. Tina Show is edgy, entertaining, and informative. Every episode will leave you with a new pearl of health wisdom to expand your knowledge base. When you're empowered, you can do better for yourself, your family, and your community. Resilience is the name of the game, and Dr. Tina is here to guide you on your way. Listen to The Dr. Tina Show today on your favorite podcast app. New episodes every Wednesday. Produced by Drake Peterson and Resident Media.